The theme this morning has been automotive and powertrain, so I want to continue with that theme. Um, I think that uh, many of you are familiar with Sintercast, so I'll just make a short introduction and update. But I want to spend most of the time that we have together to discuss how Sintercast sees the market development. <coughs> um, <coughs> so Sintercast is the industry leader for this new type of cast iron called compacted graphite iron, or CGI. And um, CGI is stronger than the conventional cast iron. It's also very good at transferring heat. So it's ideally suited for engines. Yeah, we have a thermal load from the combustion and we have a mechanical load from the pressure inside of the engine. So most of our work is with powertrain. Um, we don't actually make the castings. We provide a technology to the foundries that allows them to make the castings. So we are a tier two supplier to the automotive industry. Um, we started here in our home market of Europe and as the business evolved and as we gained experience, we expanded and we now have offices in Asia with uh, office and employees in China and Korea and also in the United States. Um, our current production, we have more than 65 components in series production. The smallest one is 2.7 kilograms, it's a turbocharger housing, and the largest one is 9,000 kilograms, a big casting for a marine boat. Um, these castings are produced in 22 different foundries um, in 11 different countries. As I mentioned, most of it is cylinder block, so we'll produce more than one million cylinder blocks this year. To put it in perspective, while we're together this morning, the Sintercast technology will be used for the production of more than 100 engines. Yeah. Um, in total, we have more than 2 million castings, so a lot of those are smaller castings, as I mentioned, exhaust manifolds, turbocharger housings, and other engine components. On the passenger car side, uh, more than 75,000 cylinder blocks per month for customers like Audi, Fiat Chrysler, um, Nissan, um, Hyundai and Kia, and also Ford. Ford is our biggest customer. We have eight engines with Ford. Um, I mentioned the exhaust components, turbocharger housings, uh, exhaust manifolds. We supply those to companies like uh, BMW, Renault, and again, Volkswagen. Um, it's difficult to keep count as the market grows, but you can buy an engine, a Sintercast engine today, in more than 53 different vehicles and 18 car brands. So it's really evolved to the point where it's a proven technology, it's an accepted technology, and it's a mainstream material. On the commercial vehicle side, we have uh, 21 components in series production, both cylinder blocks and cylinder heads, um, supplying to companies like DAF, again, Ford and Hyundai, um, Jangling Motors in China, uh, MAN, the Navistar, and here in Sweden we do the 13 liter and the 16 liter cylinder blocks for Scania. We're also active in what we call the industrial power sector. This is the off-road sector. So companies that you know, big names, Caterpillar, Cummins, Deutz for tractors, um, Doosan in Korea, Federal Mogul for large uh, engine parts for marine application, um, General Electric for locomotive, and uh, MTU, these are the big mining trucks for the open pit mines with um, you know, very large engines, 100 liter engines. Our production today is split between passenger vehicles, commercial vehicles, and those off-road components. We're about 62% <coughs> passenger vehicle, and that's what I want to focus on today, yes? Because there's a real discussion about diesel and the future of diesel, and I, I want to share with you how we see that development. Um, for commercial vehicle industrial power, this is the do domain of diesel. It will remain the domain of diesel. And so let's take our time now to focus on passenger vehicle. <coughs> Today, approximately 20% uh, of our passenger vehicle production is petrol, and 80% is diesel. So if you do that math, 80% of 62%, <coughs> something like 45 to 50% of our production is diesel engine for passenger car. And I think when you look at diesel engines for passenger cars, you have to divide it between small cars and large cars. And this is what we'll show more of during the presentation. 
Um, all of our production is for larger vehicles. So for example, uh, SUV type vehicles and pickup trucks, the Ford Super Duty pickup, indeed that's our largest production. Um, it sells more than 90% diesel and it will continue to sell more than 90% diesel. It's just not practical to have a petrol engine for such a large vehicle. Um, if we look at the need for diesel in more detail, this is a very interesting plot. It comes from ABL, the engine design company in uh, Austria. And what they're showing is that for different vehicle sizes, the total fuel consumption, and of course fuel consumption and CO2 are the same thing. And in the blue line on the top, it is the consumption if you have a petrol engine, and the red line on the bottom is for diesel engines. So we see this 20 to 30% less fuel consumption for diesel engines. It's both because diesel fuel has 11% higher energy content than petrol, and also because of the more efficient combustion of a diesel engine. So we have approximately 20 to 30% less CO2 emissions, and what we see is that these lines diverge as we go to larger vehicles. So again, it's the large vehicles that need the fuel efficiency of diesel. And it's the OEMs that need that fuel efficiency so that they can meet emissions legislation. Yeah. And what we see in the plot also is that as we get to the really big vehicles, they don't really even have gasoline engines. It's not really practical to have a gasoline <coughs> engine of six or seven <coughs> liter displacement. This is a similar plot from the supplier Bosch, you know, and, and Bosch, one of the world's largest automotive suppliers, supplying both to the internal <coughs> combustion engine and also for electric vehicles. They're showing a very similar behavior with this difference between uh, gasoline and diesel engines. And the Bosch plot shows <coughs> two other interesting things. First, this line, which shows the emissions target for the future. So even though the diesel is much better than the petrol, still more work needs to be done to get down to the emission line. It also shows that larger vehicles drive more miles. And right, we know this, yeah? It's the small vehicles that we use inside the city for running around, and if you drive a lot on the open highway, probably you want a larger, more comfortable vehicle. And so the larger vehicles drive more kilometers per year, and this is where we need to make the contribution to reduce the CO2 emissions of the entire fleet. Yeah, this is where we can make the biggest contribution. Um, lately, of course, after the Volkswagen thing, there has been a hysteria of diesel. I think that we're starting to come to the end of that. I think that the market is starting to become more rational in its view, and also the media becoming more rational in its view. And this is a very nice article from the home market here in Sweden just uh, last month where the, the main editorial says diesel cleaner than ever. And of course it's cleaner than ever. It's in the spotlight. There's so much scrutiny now on diesel that no diesel is going to get past emissions legislation uh, without being extremely clean. And as he notes at the bottom of the page, diesels belong in today's vehicles and they also belong in tomorrow's vehicles. And they will be there. Uh, we have already discussed and seen this CO2 contribution Lately, uh, the focus of governments has changed from CO2, which is a, a global warming concern, to air quality. And air quality means NOx, nitrogen oxides. Um, of course, diesels have to be NOx compliant. Um, the reality is that uh, it's been painted with a black brush recently. Um, in fairness, I don't think that was about dirty diesel. I think that was about dirty management. It was bad decision, it was bad behavior. Diesel can be clean. There are solutions to meet NOx emissions. Um, you know, in small cars, we tend to use what's called a lean NOx trap. I don't want to go into the details of the technology, but this is the, the main application uh, of the lean NOx trap. It's a lower cost solution, so it's used in smaller cars that have a lower price. Um, for larger vehicles, we tend to use SCR, Selective Catalytic Reduction. And you know this one, this is where you pour the exhaust fluid into the vehicle, right? Here in Europe, we call it AdBlue. Um, in America, they call it DEF, Diesel Exhaust Fluid. So we pour that into the vehicle, it sprays into the exhaust, and it converts the NOx into nitrogen, which is harmless, that's 80% of air, and water vapor. Yeah. So solutions are available for that. The way that it is evolving 
and this is just one example, all of the supply community has come up with solutions in the last year and a half. And the way that it's evolving is that you couple them. So you have a lean NOx trap at the beginning, and it takes care of some of the NOx, and then it moves on to the SCR chamber, and it cleans the rest of the NOx. And the downside of that is, of course, it is some more expensive. And when we talk about the future of diesel, um, this may be 1,500 euros <coughs> per vehicle. So if you're selling a small car with a price tag of 15,000 euros, it's very difficult to absorb that. And um, if you have an SUV at 50 or 60 or 70,000 euros, it's no problem. Yeah. And as I say, this is where the OEMs need the diesel to meet their CO2 legislation. So there are solutions. Um, they're being used in America today. Um, here in Europe, we don't always uh, think of America as a leader in terms of fuel efficiency, and they're not, and they're not. However, uh, the NOx emissions level in the United States is one half of the NOx emissions level here in Europe. Yeah? And these vehicles are satisfying U.S. emissions legislation today. So they will satisfy the European legislation for 2025 and 2030. Um, <clears throat> The other thing that is coming which uh, secures the emissions uh, for diesel engines is new emissions test cycles. So in the next two years we'll introduce what's called the uh, WLTC, it's the World Harmonized Light Duty Test Cycle. And also you've heard about now testing the vehicles as they drive on the road, not the way that they are in a laboratory. And this is called RDE, Real Driving Experience. And the intent of these two new cycles <coughs> is to eliminate the risk of cheating by the OEMs yeah, so that we have real testing conditions. I will also say when it comes to fuel economy, um, you know, the vehicles that surpass the sticker for fuel efficiency are diesels. Yeah? In fact, the ones that are least likely to meet the stated fuel economy on the sticker are hybrids. There's a lot of surprises. Um, also, just a small word about diesel bans. We hear now about cities discussing diesel bans. We hear about uh, governments discussing diesel bans. I think that we have to really read the fine print in that. In fact, they're not banning combustion engines. Uh, what they're talking about is banning vehicles that only have combustion engines. If the vehicle also has some type of electric <coughs> assist, um, it is not banned. So what we will see in the long-term future is perhaps uh, electric assistance of internal combustion engines. And, and I'll show some forecasts for that as we go. I, again, I think it will be surprising. For me, it is odd that a government can discuss banning a technology in, for example, 2030 or 2040, when they don't even know the capability of the technology. Yeah? We have a lot of opportunities still to improve. So set the NOx target, set the CO2 target, and let the companies try to meet the emissions. If they need it, they can sell them. If they don't need it, they can't sell them. Simple. Set the targets, get out of the way. Uh, so let us look at then some forecasts. And these are all forecasts that were published in 2017. So they're all current. And they're from players in the industry, whether it's uh, design consultancy firms or suppliers. So it's a real insight on the market development. This first one from Bosch, it's showing uh, different engine types, as you can see in the top right corner here. Diesel, different types of gasoline, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and finally in green electric vehicles. And then they show what it was in 2015 on the left, in 2020 on the right, and for Western Europe, the US, China, and Japan. What do you see overall in this? You see that nothing really changes. In this near term, there isn't going to be a change. Um, interesting other things that we can see is that diesel volume increasing in Western Europe, according to Bosch, increasing also in the United States from 1.6 million per year to 1.8 million per year. The other thing that we see is that this green section, uh, pure electric vehicles, is so very small in both scenarios. Yeah? And all of these vehicles in the blue color, all of these have an internal combustion engine. They may have electric assistance, but they are all based on the internal combustion engine. Um, let's continue to look out, because this is to 2020. Over the next few overheads, we'll step with different forecasts through to 2030. 
So this one from PricewaterhouseCoopers, it's a very similar view, um, North America on the left, Europe on the right, the dark red at the bottom is petrol, the bright red is uh, diesel here, and then above that we have hybrids and plug-in hybrids and electric vehicles. What do you see? Generally, not a big change. Diesel in North America growing, yes. Um, here in Europe, diesel declining, that's what we expect. It's currently at about 50%, going down to something like 40% in 2021. And that's okay, the ones that are declining are the small ones, not the Sintercast ones. Yeah, we'll show that a little bit later as well. But again, pointing out here, nothing is changing so much in the near term. Why did the diesel increase in America in both of these scenarios? It's because the American OEMs have already announced new diesel engines that will start production in the next couple of years. So this is an advertisement that just appeared in Automotive News, the main trade magazine for the industry, um, just last month in October. And the lineup for the Ford F-150, yes, the pickup truck, the largest selling vehicle in North America. It's not the largest selling vehicle in North America. It's the largest selling vehicle in the world. Yeah. They have five engines today, all petrol, and coming soon, 3.0 liter power stroke diesel. So, interestingly, that one, the little 2.7, that's our petrol engine. We spoke earlier about the Sintercast petrol engines. This one, Sintercast CGI diesel engine. So that's our growth opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's gonna start next year, probably in the first <coughs> quarter or something like that. And I also show the forecast for North America. This is for the first nine months of the year, so through the end of September. The top three selling vehicles in North America, all pickups. That's been the case since uh, 2010. The Ford F-150 has been the top selling vehicle in North, in North America for 35 years now. Yeah? And for as long as anyone is brave enough to predict whether that's five years or seven years, those three pickup vehicles are still the three highest selling vehicles in North America. Those big vehicles with high fuel consumption, they need a diesel contribution to meet the fleet average. Um, here's now one from uh, IHS. IHS Market is the leading <coughs> forecaster company um, in the auto industry. Um, we're in 2017 now, which is kind of this middle bar, and they forecast out now we're at 2025. So gasoline growing a little bit, primarily at the expense of diesel, but diesel still taking up a significant portion of the market, primarily for larger vehicles, and a very small portion for electric vehicles and hydrogen. Very consistent, same that we saw with the other ones. And this came from a publication just uh, in September, and it's just outside the room if you want a copy of it. It's a very sensible and rational overview of how the market will evolve. Um, now from IHS again, this time to 2028. And what we see now with the trend in vehicle uh, powertrain. So in brown, this is an internal combustion engine with soft start. Of course, that's going to grow. A normal internal <coughs> combustion engine without electrification will decline. That's diesel and petrol. And the real growth is in so-called mild hybrid. This is the 48-volt systems. I think this is where the market will end up. This will be the main solution going forward. Um, a full hybrid engine losing ground to the 48-volt. What they say about 48-volt, you get 70% of the benefit of a full hybrid at 30% of the cost. Yeah, this is where the market is going. Um, and then at the top, this small <coughs> amount again, consistently for electric vehicles. Uh, I said that we could look at the way that uh, the different segments of the market change with regard to diesel. Um, so this is, uh, well, let's think of it as at the top, large cars, middle-sized cars, and small cars. And we have a decline, which is pretty much what everyone is expecting for diesel. Um, but for the large vehicles, again, they need it. The decline will be smaller. Yeah, there's still a market opportunity and a growth opportunity for us. Uh, finally then, we look at uh, a different forecast. This is from Continental, another automotive supplier. So both on the internal combustion side and on the electric side, they go out to 2030 now. We see this uh, decline a little bit in gasoline. Diesel as well declining a bit. The main growth, as I said, 48 volt. This is where everybody is. Um, 
uh, mild hybrids, full hybrids, and finally electric vehicles. The interesting thing in this plot, again, everything with ex the exception of the green at the top has an internal combustion engine. As you look out, you read that uh, first plot that I showed from Bosch, at the bottom it said, um, the internal combustion engine will dominate the powertrain for the next 20 years. And that's certainly the case. So I think we really have to be wary of this electric word. There's a big difference between an electric vehicle and an electrified vehicle. And I think that the market is trying to stretch that um, very much in a marketing and sales way. But it can be misleading. Uh, before we finish, I want to look at the life cycle analysis. Everything that we've done until now looks at the emissions from a vehicle on the road. But of course, there are emissions from vehicles uh, during the production phase. There are emissions in terms of getting the energy to the vehicle, whether it is electricity or diesel or petrol or hydrogen. Yeah, you have to make that as well. You have to recycle the vehicle. So if we really want to make a contribution to the environment, we have to look at the full CO2 emissions over the entire life of the vehicle. Um, and a lot of people are starting to do that now. It's becoming more popular and the results, as I say, are surprising. So let's start with this one because I think that for me it's a, an easy presentation. Then we can look at some presentations that are a bit more difficult. Um, at the top we have the electric vehicles. Um, let's ignore for the moment the different types of gas. And at the bottom, diesel and petrol. So in red at the beginning, this is the energy to make the vehicle. Yeah? <laughs> For electric vehicles, we have an added energy to make the batteries. And then depending on what type of electricity we use, if we have the grid in the EU or the USA or China, we have the provision of the electricity to the vehicle. And this is the total CO2 over the life of the vehicle, something like 200,000 kilometers. Yeah? When we come down to diesel, again the vehicle, getting the fuel to the uh, petrol station, and then the emissions on the road, and of course we don't have that dark blue up here. What's my point, is it better? No, that's not my point. My point is, it's not that different, yeah? And I think this is a story that we all have to get our heads around. While the government is saying, go, go, go toward electric, and this is about tailpipe, let's look at the whole story. Are you really making things better? Um, indeed, not always. Uh, this one from ABL, we're going to go through a few different life cycles now. So this one from ABL, ABL, again the engine design company in Austria. This is a diesel engine in Austria. This is if you use fuel from hydrogenated vegetable oils. And this is if you use biomass. And you see the total CO2 emission over the life of the vehicle. On the right side of the plot we have electric vehicles with the electricity grid in Austria, in the EU, in Germany, and in China. Who is pushing most? for electric vehicles, it's China. China has 63% of its energy made from coal. Yeah, That's not gonna change. It's not gonna change in the next 25 years. China is starting a new coal-fired power station every three days. Yeah, This mix in the grid will not change. Um, what we see from this plot is that a, a real key to the future is also in the fuels. If we can deliver fuels that are CO2 neutral or even CO2 negative, and then the internal combustion engine is really the most efficient. Uh, two more, I think. So this is uh, from IAV, another engine design consulting company. They don't just do engines, they also do electric powertrains, so they don't have a, a cherry pick in this. Um, they're showing gasoline vehicles with today's energy mix, and if the fuel could be CO2 neutral. A diesel engine, same today, and with CO2 neutral fuel. A diesel hybrid, a gasoline plug-in hybrid, a battery vehicle, and a fuel cell vehicle, yeah, where we have to deliver the hydrogen. This is the fascinating thing, right? We're, we're all about plug-in, we're all about electrified. Who in the room would have thought that when you change from a diesel hybrid to a plug-in hybrid, that the CO2 emissions increase? Yeah. So we have to be careful that we don't focus too much on tailpipe. We have to be careful that we don't make legislation that actually increases CO2. This is the risk. Uh, and finally from FEV, another uh, automotive design consultancy company based in Germany. 
Uh, you get the same thing where the bottom is the vehicle production, the provision of the fuel, and finally the on-road. So let's just look at them quickly. This is a petrol engine, a diesel engine, um, a hybrid with a petrol engine, a hybrid with a diesel engine, a battery electric vehicle with the grid mix from 2015, a battery electric vehicle if we have 50% from renewables, a battery electric vehicle where it's all from renewables, a fuel cell vehicle where you have 100% renewable supply of hydrogen, but then interestingly, um, combustion engine with 30% CO2 reduction in the fuel, diesel with 30% reduction, petrol with 90% reduction CO2, and a diesel engine with 90% reduction CO2. If you can get the CO2 out of the fuel, and there are ways to do this, um, it's clearly the most efficient solution. Yeah? And again, the point about diesel, it's not that it's not bad, it's better. And let's not throw this thing away on emotion. So some final thoughts. Um, the dialogue has been hysterical. Um, the polit politicians are pushing us toward electrification. Um, I don't know why. I don't know if that is because of a lack of knowledge, if it's because it's a vote winner. Um, not all politicians are doing it. Uh, Angela Merkel was very good in the German elections. She clearly said that we need diesel. And she said that the, the OEMs have to be more honest and take care of the NOx and stop cheating. But her point was, solve the NOx, take the emotion out of it. And that's what we need to do. Let's get away from the hysteria and do what's best for the environment. Um, ultimately, the market is rational. They have to sell vehicles and they have to be profitable. They also have to sell the vehicles that people want to buy. Um, as I said earlier, let's be wary of this difference between electric and electrification. I think a lot of companies are starting to stretch that to make political capital. Be wary of the bans. They're not actually banning the engines. They're banning vehicles without some sort of electric support of the engine. And as we saw in all of those forecasts, unanimous that something like 90% of the engines, and sorry, 90% of the vehicles in 2030 will have internal combustion engines. And um, we have to start putting an equal emphasis on the fuels, not just carbon neutral fuels, but actually carbon negative fuels. If you think of a household waste site or a dump where CO2 is cooking off of the surface as things decompose, take that CO2, combine it with hydrogen, you have a liquid fuel with a very high energy content, and when you burn it in a vehicle, you actually reduce CO2 because you've prevented it from going into the atmosphere. Um, so with this outlook, um, we see growth for Sintercast in all three of the sectors, passenger vehicle, commercial vehicle, and off-road. Um, we have some other technologies cooking. I didn't want to talk about them today, but if you invite us back, we'll do that next time. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Okay, um, it's interesting. This morning I saw that uh, Tesla has come up with a new electric truck. Mm -hmm. So that seems to be, uh, is your, are you concerned about electrification in the trucking so since your focus is big uh -huh. engines? Yeah, thank you, because we talked all day about passenger vehicles. Um, there's two types of trucks. There's the trucks that run around in the cities. That can be appropriate for electrification. Then you have the long-haul trucks. This is absolutely not appropriate. Um, today, those trucks will carry something like a 1,000 liters of fuel. That's normal. Um, with a current lithium-ion battery, the state-of-the-art battery, you would need 30 tons of batteries to equal the 1,000 liters of fuel. And today, a, a truck is uh, 15 tons for the truck. It carries 15 to 20 tons of goods. So if you have 30 tons per batteries, it doesn't leave much for K. I mean, if you're in the business of transporting feathers, you're okay. Um, <laughs> the other thing is, you know, there's a saying in the industry that if you, um, you buy a car to spend money, you buy a truck to make money, yeah? And we know that if you have an electric car, you have to leave it plugged in at home overnight or whatever so you can drive it the next day. Fair enough, that, that's good. Um, but when a truck is plugged in, it's not making money, yeah? That truck has to be rolling on the road to make money. If you take all those long haul trucks and say, we're gonna park them for four hours a day or six hours per day or whatever it is to recharge them, you lose 24% of your revenue. It's not gonna happen, it's just not gonna happen. Uh, talking about revenue, um, <laughs> you have uh, one of the bigger uh, things for, um, going forward for you is the Ford 150. Yes. Uh, has it been delayed? Because it's 
big part of your uh, uh, income for next year or revenue for next year? Yeah, thank you. Um, so Ford announced it at the Detroit Auto Show in January. They said they would start selling it this autumn. They now talk about selling it as we saw in that overhead in, in the first quarter of next year or the spring of next year. So it's coming. There's no problem with the engine. We talked about diesel engines having such a scrutiny now. It takes longer to get the approval. It's just going through the approval process. Uh, I hope that it's in showrooms, uh, you know, March, April, something like that. I don't know. This okay. is my hope. Okay. Um, any other questions from the room? Uh, we still one last question. And um, uh, this year, it seems that you have a little bit lower turnover. Uh, what's the underlying reasons? Just quickly. Yeah, you're right. We're we're flat. Yeah, we're flat. Uh, the production has been flat. We haven't had new programs coming on stream really. Um, this year, we had three programs that were a bit lower. Um, you know, in our big programs. Every time we get a new engine, it's like 10% growth for us. So we, we also have a program that's down that can hit us by 10%. Um, one of them that was down was that Ford F-150. They were retooling the line to get ready for the F-150, so that's come back. Uh, one was a big uh, truck engine. It's come back, so it's now on par with last year. Um, still, we are down on the uh, diesel engine for Fiat Chrysler. It's for the Jeep Grand Cherokee and the Ram 1500. Um, the EPA opposed it uh, back in January. They gave permission to start selling it again on 28 July. <coughs> so even in the third quarter, that's kind of July out. So we only get two thirds. So it shouldn't help us much in the third quarter. Hopefully it starts to come back fourth quarter. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, one last question. Before. What is your market share in your theoretical market? Uh, theoretical market, so if I do trucks, I would say they're about 30% CGI today, so there's still 70% growth opportunity. Um, on the passenger vehicle side, we're really good on the diesel. We have one petrol engine, we have other petrol engines cooking. I would say that we're something like 5% uh, penetration, so a lot of opportunity to grow into. And likewise on industrial power, really small still. What is uh, realistically to uh, hope for? Realistic to hope for? Historically, we've had double-digit growth. I think since 2007, we have compounded our annual growth rate of about 12%. I'd like to get back to that. I think we can grow double digits every year in the next three, five-year horizon. We One just have to get through this flat patch question. Uh, yeah. Do you have any of the new Chinese producers? Uh, uh, China for us is a truck and off-road market. Diesel is not so popular. Um, I think that for petrol vehicles in China, we have to establish reference in, in the West before the Chinese will follow that. So for us, uh, China is primarily a truck market, and that's not bad. China is the biggest truck market in the world. It's slightly bigger than Europe plus America combined. And in China right now, you know, it's just starting. They're one to two emissions generations behind the West when they adopt the next generations of emissions legislation, they will also adopt the same solutions. So China's a good growth opportunity. On the theme China, with, with some of the data that you showed on kind of the life cycle, uh, CO2 emissions when produ producing fuel and so on, would you, would you say that the emphasis going on now in China and also Japan for fuel cells is that misguided and they'll sort of see the error in their ways and roll that back or where do you think that will end up? I think that uh, there will be many different solutions. I think that China, I'm not talking about fuel cells, China on electrification, they differentiate between the coal-fired plant in the countryside and the smog of the vehicle in the city. Yeah, And so they prioritize it like that. Um, for a global point of view, they make the wrong decision. Um, if you take uh, the energy mix in China, <coughs> they have 6.7 liters per 100 kilometers equivalent fuel consumption. India also talks about using electric vehicles. On the Indian electric mix, it's 7.7 .7 liters per 100 kilometers. They can easily do better than that with conventional powertrains. To develop high costs in those developing countries to make more CO2, crazy. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you.